everyone and um, a warm welcome to all of you. I'm Antonio Martinez Arboleda, professor in open and digital education here at the University of Leeds. And it's my pleasure to serve um, as your host for today's event. As some of you uh, may know from previous events, I'm academic lead for open educational practice and also a senior leading Ken here at the University of Leeds, where I collaborate with my very esteemed colleagues um, that are part of our team uh, to advance uh, the networks initiatives. Uh, and uh, I've been deeply involved in the Knowledge Equity Network, uh, Ken, uh, since, it, 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 since its inception, yeah? So the Knowledge Equity Network, what is it? Uh, it's a coalition of institutions, organizations, and individuals, including educators and researchers, dedicated to the principles and aspirations outlined, outlined in our Declaration on Knowledge Equity, which are uh, summarizing open research, open education, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Our declaration welcomes the participation from universities, research institutes, educators, researchers, experts, uh, funding agency, publishers, and international organizations. Everyone, absolutely everyone, can play a role in our network. So through the declaration, Declaration on Knowledge Equity, we express our commitment to openness, whether it is open knowledge, open science, and research, or open practices. We recognize the crucial need to enhance our shared digital infra infrastructures, paving the way for greater levels of openness. It is also essential that the contributions of educators, researchers, and other university staff in open education and research are duly acknowledged and celebrated. And uh, our vision extends beyond all this. Of course, we aim to foster and shape a landscape where knowledge is democratically accessible and where diversity and inclusion are not just ideals, but realities within higher education. So the declaration is our commitment to these transformative goals. And the mission of the Knowledge Equity Network is straightforward. We strive towards the objectives laid out in the declaration in a collaborative way. Eh? We understand that this ambition requires collaboration over competition, uh, unity over isolation. So our net network is not just a platform, but a community where knowledge is shared and support is mutual. Every individual and every organization here have a role to play in aiding other institutions to embrace, embrace knowledge equity, inclusiveness, and diversity. So if you uh, who are watching us today uh, as an individual or as an institution, if you are aligned with our mission, I'd like to encourage you to make your commitment official by signing our declaration, the Declaration on Knowledge Equity Network at knowledgeequitynetwork.com. Uh, and now let me talk a little bit about, uh, about our events. Today's event is a great example of the Ken spirit because we are bringing together experts in equity, diversity, uh, inclusion, and decolonization. Um, however, our conversation throughout our events, past and future, will not uh, does not stop here. Uh, it is an ongoing dialogue encompassing various aspects of our declaration with events, uh, events past and planned, in uh, the following threads, yeah? Open education, open science, professional recognition, uh, digital infrastructure, and equity, diversity, and inclusion, including alternative knowledge systems. And these events are designed for knowledge sharing, reflection, and community building in preparation for concerted collaborative action around our common cause. So today, uh, today we're going to look into the intricate relationship between equity, uh, um, equality, equity, diversity, and inclusion, EDI, and knowledge equity. And we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Kendi Wantai, Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here at the University of Leeds, and our guest speaker, Dr. Robinson Morris, who is the founder and chief of Reimaginolutionary, eh? or the Reimaginolution, mm? 
He's the revolutionary of imagination, uh, founder of this fantastic organization. And uh, so together, uh, they will explore EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and its profound impact on knowledge equity. The discussion hopefully will foreground uh, the significance of EDI in establishing equitable and open practices, emphasizing accessibility and inclusivity. So uh, our speakers will also look at the question of intersectionality within EDI frameworks, acknowledging how these intersections uniquely and cumulatively affect individuals. And they will shed light on how to intertwine EDI and knowledge equity within policies and strategies for a more inclusive, accessible, and equitable environment. So let's get into it. How will this session work? So in today's session, we will foster a natural and engaging conversation, free-flowing conversation between our guests, uh, Kendi and David, uh, with minimal intervention from my side. Yeah? Uh, I don't intend to take part into the discussions. I will contribute to scaffolding the, the event, but this is a conversation, an open conversation. And what about yourself? Well, your participation yeah, through questions uh, and comments, insights, is highly valued. Yeah, uh, It will enrich our dialogue in the second part of the event. Uh, you are welcome to start posting your questions uh, and comments anytime, yeah? You don't have to wait for for uh, David and Candy to finish their their conversation. And uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Candy Guntai, uh, who will later introduce David, um, to start today's enlightening conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you very much. And yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Antonio has already introduced me. I will not introduce myself again, but rather I will hand right over to DRM. DRM and I have known each other for a good few years now, I think, or about just two years or something. I can't remember quite DRM, um, but it's always a pleasure to work with you. <coughs> Perhaps you could uh, take us through the community agreement to get a sense of how we will be with each other in this session. Perfect. Thank you, Kendi. Thank you, Antonio. Kendi, it feels like we've known each other forever, uh, and I'm sure we have in some respects. Uh, as Antonio said, uh, my name is David Robinson Morris. I am the founder and chief reimagilutionary of the Reimagilution, uh, which helps us to re enliven our imaginations. The first thing to go in any oppressive system is the imagination. So it's the first thing that we have to get back if we're going to think our way, be our way do our way out of the current mess we find ourselves in across the globe. Um, I'll move into our community agreements for today. Uh, these are agreements that uh, I love to raise because it, it helps us to shape the space, place, and time uh, where we have all intersected, right? So <laughs> I'll, I'll pick up a couple of these, right? The first is that engagement in community with life, with a text, with the conversation is the key to learning. Um, the, the next one I'll lift up is that uh, we must recognize the dignity and respect the personhood of each human being involved uh, in our conversation today. The third is that, and I think one of the most important, is that we dialogue in order that we might understand. Understanding, not agreement, is the chief aim of our time together. Right? We practice conversational justice, which means that we only say what needs to be said and allow the room and space for others to say what they need to say. Um, we uh, understand that not every question will have an answer, but will require us to live the question. Um, and then finally, I want you to be open to the possibility of the new, right? A new thought, a new way of being, a new understanding. Beautiful. I'm sure thumbs up uh, to our audience. Uh, if you can... Uh, you can agree with us that that is what we are uh, going to, to do and be today. Beautiful. Now, we'll, we'll begin very briefly um, as we've been preparing for, uh, for this uh, discussion today with terms, I believe it's critically important um, that we develop a shared language, right? We use these words 
equity, diversity, inclusion, justice, equality, uh, decolonialism. Um, and we are not always talking about the same thing, right? We are using the same words, but not necessarily uh, the common meaning or understanding, right? So we understand diversity to be very simply all the ways that people differ, right? It includes age, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, issues of ability, socioeconomic status, marital status, education, language, all of those ways in which we differ. But inclusion, when we talk about inclusion, we're actually talking about creating environments um, where individuals and groups feel respected, feel like they belong, where they feel welcome, where they are um, valued to fully participate in the life of the community of the organization. Right? And then we move, um, we talk about um, equity a lot, a great deal. And equity, very simply, is uh, creating an environment where everyone is allowed to thrive according to their definition of thriving, right? And this is different, Kendi, from equality, which my understanding is used very often in the UK versus equity, which is used very often in, um, in the States. Can you talk a little bit about equality, what, what the meaning of equality is from a UK perspective? Yeah, so thankfully, DRM, we have moved on a little bit and we have also started talking about equity. So um, my role, for instance, is being for equity, diversity and inclusion. And it is really important, as you say, for people to know the difference because equality is not, uh, equality is about creating an equal playing field, which then speaks to the structural piece um, as opposed to equity, where equity, we are saying what you say here about free, free, uh, fair treatment of all people. People don't need the same things. We are different. We are differently abled. And this is fine. There is nothing wrong with that. And instead of having that deficit model of trying to fix people, he's trying to create structures that allow people, as you have said, to thrive as they come, as they are. So when you try and have equality, um, sometimes it is an assumption of, on a, of an homogeneity in our humanness that does not really exist. So what happens is that you create a standard that is not cannot uh, benefit everybody within a certain population. And so it has its limitations. So we can only use equality when we talk about the structures and the spaces, but we cannot talk equality about equality when we talk about people and populations. Yeah. Love that. So yeah. I hope that that kind of helps to to to, to uh, clarify that a little bit. So I'll hand back to you, David. Thank you. That's beautiful. Equality about structures, uh, equity about outcomes. Right. Yes. Um, yeah, Perfect. that's beautiful. Justice is another word that we use. It's one of my favorite words, but it's also one of the most confusing words, uh, perhaps, uh, because, again, we say this word often, but we don't know exactly what it means, right? The, the definition for justice um, is giving people what is due to them in accordance with the moral or legal principles, values, and ethics of a society. It could be fair treatment. Um, there's a beautiful... Um, contemplative theologian who says that justice is the outflow of a broken heart, right? Uh, you have Cornel West, who, who's a scholar here in the States, who says that uh, justice is what love looks like in public. Um, and I often ask people, what does justice look like if your heart was already broken before the outflow, right? What does justice look like if you practice thin love, which Toni Morrison says is no love at all? If, if justice is what love looks like in public. So we've moved, I've been moving from this definition of giving folks what is due to them to this definition um, by, by Dion Brand, um, who says that uh, justice is very simply, right, the move away from tyranny toward liberation, right? It is a move against tyranny toward liberation. And what Brand says is that um, justice for people who look like me in the world has never been just. 
right? Um, so therefore, I cannot rely on notions of justice, right? That that I did not create, um, and that were, that have been imposed upon me from the outside. And so for me, justice has to be about this move against tyranny, tyranny of the state, tyranny of colonialism, right? Tyranny of all of those things that oppress us toward liberation. Yes. And finally, we, we move into, you know, a lot of our, our work can be um, as diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals, uh, we often say has to equal, um, the outcome has to be belonging and matter, right? Uh, belonging, do you see me? Do you value my presence in this space, right? Um, mattering, is my contribution to whatever is happening in a group, in a community, uh, in a system, is it valued, right? Uh, is it making a difference? Uh, and am I, this is the most important part with matter, am I appreciated and publicly acknowledged for the good work that I do, right? And then the, the last slide is just a little graphic that I, that I love to, um, to throw up because it's very simple, right? Diversity, which is a fact, is about representation. Inclusion uh, is about behavior and culture. Belonging is a feeling, right? You feel like you belong. Equity is about systems, right? And justice is the result, right? Kendi, how do you feel about that? I love that. Every time, and especially every time I see that graphic, I'm like, yes, we should just have this up everywhere so that people can, it's just so simple. It makes it so clear. And we have had a conversation with you before where you sort of um, explained how diversity is a fact, right? Mm -hmm. um, inclusion is a culture and equity is a, a, a choice or a process. And I think about diversity from the UK perspective and we or equity, diversity and inclusion. And when you talked about diversity and you gave all of those characteristics, we do have an Act of Parliament, um, Act, the, the Equalities Act 2010, where they list the protected characteristics. But in this country, sometimes we, we look at the protected characteristics and don't go beyond that. But we know, for instance, something that is really important in this country and defines how we live with each other is social class. That's really important. It's not one of the protected characteristics that can be compounding when you intersect it with any of the other um, protected characteristics. It is also important to understand that when we look at, inclusion, as, at uh, diversity as fact, for us to accept diversity as fact, we need to first accept the humanness of each and every one of us, centering our humanity, right? But then we have this notion where if we look at what we call the colonial project, how does it position humanity? Who is considered to be human? So there is a quote I came across just as I was preparing for this session by an Iranian scholar, um, Hamid Dabashi, and Hamid asks a rhetorical question, can non-Europeans think can non-Europeans think? And it's a rhetorical question, but the reason is this notion to be European or to be a white person is to be human, and to be anything um, other than white is to be other, right? And so that question becomes, it sort of just sits there, like the elephant in the room. And unless that question is addressed, and we all accept, no, hang on a minute, we are all human, diverse, different, and that difference is welcome here then really we can never achieve real diversity. And uh, Walter Mitchell, who's one of the writers, um, he, you know, a lot of work around decolonization or decolonizing, he says, um, he answers um, Hamid and he says, yes, non-Europeans and other interiorized, marginalized and oppressed people of the world can think and produce knowledge 
um, 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 a knowledge using the full range of human attributes. So there is knowledge that is other than European knowledge or Eurocentric knowledge. And so that brings us to decolonizing and decolonization. So underpinning EDI, our equity, our diversity, our inclusion, is this spirit of thinking around decolonizing. And what is decolonizing really? I mean, there are different ways of looking at it and there are all manner of complex and interesting definitions out there. But I like what Sabelle and Glovo Gasheni talks about and um, they look at how the colonial project itself was about power, knowledge and being. So that being part is what I have talked about, right? How we be with each other, that which is human, that which is not. And then of course there is power, power over, where we've had dominance, dominance of our knowledge, dominance of who we are, dominance of the world, view, where um, by trying to homogen um, homogenize everything, we've narrowed that the human experience into a very prescriptive Eurocentric way of looking at the world. Now, there is nothing wrong with being Eurocentric, but the problem becomes when, through the colonial project, you then uh, export that Eurocentricism, make everybody wrong, and this becomes a standard for that, the way we know that which is valued as knowledge. And like someone said to me the other day, somebody said to them that uh, to decolonize is to remove all reason and replace it with witchcraft. Mm. And uh, that is a very weird way of looking at the world, right? Because then it is perceived that unless it is European, Eurocentric, geopolitical north, um, then it can't be worth its salt. It can't be real. It cannot be true. It, can, it cannot be real knowledge. So I think it is really important that we consider all of these things together as we talk about equity in knowledge. When we talked about inclusion, I love that you brought, his, you brought in belonging. Because with inclusion, what sometimes happens is that the includer di dictates for the person they are including when they take up space, how much space they take up and how they take up that space, how they behave, how they be with those they have found there. So the structural piece never changes, right? So what we want to do now is to ensure with belonging, because unless you can actually ask that the person being included, whether they feel a sense of belonging, and inclusion isn't really working. It's performative, isn't it? And if you are coming as you are, taking up space as you are, the structures must yield. They cannot stay the same because the reason why you are not in in the first place is because the structures were designed to keep you out. So if you are in and the structures stay the same, there's something wrong. Something needs to start shape shifting because you are now in this space. So how is higher education, knowledge, for instance, our production of knowledge, our dissemination of knowledge. How is that shifting for having more brown and black people uh, being able to contribute to the body of global body of knowledge? How is this changing? How are we making space for alternative ways of knowing or do we simply dismiss them as witchcraft? Therefore not fit for our four star publications. I shall leave that one there. Yes, so these are some of the thoughts that I had when I was thinking about um, what Antonio and the team were asking us to have a conversation about today. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Sierra? Well, Kendi, that's uh, you. You said a lot, right? And um, I think there are there are volumes of books written on everything that you've just you just said. Uh, I would say I, I I agree, right? And this the the colonial project um, is not uh, as old as we think it is. Right, it is in the history of time a fairly new project, um, and we find this move, right, from feeling beings to thinking beings uh, that takes place during the Enlightenment, where we begin to privilege the mind over other ways of knowing um, that have always existed within all cultures, right? Um, but because of militarism, because of power, because of dominance. Right, that has become the way that we come to know um, across the world um, while denying the other ways of how we come to know, right? Um, and so for me, the, the decolonial project is about returning to, right, ways of knowing that are indigenous to me, um, that are indigenous to um, 
as a as a member of the African diaspora of of the continent, right, and of in in individual cultures that uh, don't necessarily privilege uh, the written word or the the thought, <clears throat> right, but privilege uh, being attuned to everything through the body, um, which in and of itself is a mind, right? It gives us all the information that we need. Um, so we have we have a lot of work to do to get there, right? As folks who are engaged in higher education, in some ways, we too have bought into this knowledge production system. Um, and um, we have been colonized in real ways, um, right? To, to produce, um, to think, to reason, um, to use Eurocentric logic, right, in our in our reasoning, um, which only gets us to one point and not to 50, right, uh, potential outcomes, right? So in some ways, it has limited the scope of who we are and who we can be, right? Um, and so the goal is to break out of that. The goal is to drop back down. For me, the goal is to drop back down in the body and to feel the world and to understand that there is um, there is a, a knowing that doesn't think, right? Because Absolutely. The thinking comes to us. Completely, I couldn't agree more. That is so, so, so important. The idea that our own decolonizing starts from the mind, and there is the uh, lovely book by Professor Ngoji Wathiongo, uh, Decolonizing the Mind, and it talks a lot about language and our ways of thinking and you know as you argue that uh, taking away of your imagination being one of the first thing that goes um, in the colonial project for you for, for, for that power over to work you know um, over the colonized and I think there is a way in which when we think about African scholarship it's always been there and it's just been in, rendered invisible you know, that it doesn't matter. And so when we even look at institutions of higher learning from the geopolitical South and particularly from Africa, they have got to subscribe to a standard of excellence, an excellence model that was never created by or for them. So if you look at world rankings, for instance, you will struggle to find African universities on any global world rankings. Does that mean that there are no good African universities? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that there is a standard that is being imposed on them that really simply doesn't work. The environment is different, the context is different, but it still has value and an, and an amazing contribution, global contribution. And a lot has come historically from Africa. It's not about knowledge coming now with Western um, Western centric views of what a university or place of higher learning should look feel like we've had those spaces in Africa for millennia, you know, but that is something that is not even spoken about. And um, in terms of knowledge production, what do we value, you know, uh, what do we produce as holders and custodians of our knowledge? Um, four star journals or other many star journals becoming the only way that we can communicate this invaluable knowledge and nuggets that we are creating and finding out even in, in institutions of higher learning, to me, that's quite limited. There are many other ways of curating that which is known. And human, the human race, the survival of the human race has been through that diver those diverse ways of curating, disseminating, sharing, having opportunities to recreate and co-create and find new meanings in the world in the many, many ways that we can share that knowledge. Yeah. So thank you for that. That's really making me think now. <clears throat> Antonio, we've been talking for quite a while. I'm just yeah, mindful uh, that you're no, there, probably. Uh, oh my I God, am, no, it has been amazing. I'm learning a lot of things, actually. It's uh, illuminating, truly. Um, do, we, do you think we could have some uh, questions from the audience and also from myself? Because I have questions as well. So, uh, yeah. No, there is a question uh, in the chat. Um, Somebody is reading Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown. Um, and uh, while citing Octavia E. Butler, mm -hmm. uh, Adrian refers to the importance of imagination in social justice. I love this question because, you know, I think we need a lot of imagination to escape from uh, the cultural 
structures yeah um what do you what do you think about this um this idea of imagination uh, um to uh, within social justice it's uh, for david first perhaps sure I, I first i love that they're reading adrian marie brown she is uh, <clears throat> amazing Emerging strategies is great and octavia butler you know as well as other black writers um left us a, a roadmap right on the power of the imagination right octavia butler said in an interview once that you know she wrote her books because she could write herself into the story where she was excluded in real life, but right? That's the power of the imagination. Um, and for social justice work, right? For social action work, for social transformation work, we have to engage the imagination. We have to think outside of what's being thought. And we have to, we have to, to dream boldly about what could be Right. Um, you know, in the in the new age world, we call that manifesting. Right. We call that um, bringing up something um, that is not as though it were right in Christianity. They call it faith. Um, but how do you make a new world manifest? Right. It first starts in the imagination. Mm. Um, and so it's critically important for social justice. Um, but I'll, I'll add this caveat. The most important part about imagination and social justice is that the imagining has to be collective, right? So what, what we didn't touch on, Kindi, right, was um, was that I, in my academic life, I study Ubuntu, right? And I, I know you are a lover of Ubuntu and a study of Ubuntu as well. Um, and the this notion, this very, very Eurocentric notion of an individual self, right, is a false notion. Um, and until, uh, at least in my own work, this is what I do, until we can understand and transform our notions of individual subjectivity into collective and intersubjective knowings and understandings of who we are as human beings, um, we will not get anywhere. And so with the imagination, a collective imagining has to occur so that we're all moving, being, feeling in the same direction. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I have here a question that um, has arrived um, in the questions and answers. Uh, somebody says, I agree with everything that has been said, along with the importance of everything else. Uh, sometimes, uh, this person says, uh, sometimes in existing structures, the designers or the inheritors of that structure are in a position of privilege, whereby it is in their best interest to keep the way it is. Uh, how can we make progress in this sphere? What can individuals do? Great question. Candy, would you like to start with that one and then David can complete it? Yes, of course, I can start with that and I'll build on what David just said, that this work must be done collectively. The beauty of Ubuntu is that Ubuntu knows no white, no black, no creed, no nothing. It only talks of our humanity and our shared humanity. When we talk about decentering whiteness or decentering Eurocentric views, what are we replacing that with then? Is it not our humanness and our humanity, our shared humanity? So our shared humanity is something that I feel once we then recognize even, because you see, so racism, for instance, let's take that as an example. We assume <laughs> that the racialized are the ones who suffer from racism. Really, you know, it's my father who says, it's like taking poison, you know, wishing your, your enemy will die, but you're the one drinking the poison. So who's gonna die here, you know? So at the end of the day, racism hurts everybody. This iniquity hurts everybody there was a time when and we know that things come in waves right so economic power uh, military power whatever it is we know there is a wave of change coming so are we going to be the kind of humanity where those who possess whatever it is that at that point in time civilization considers to be important that they subjugate others that they have power over that they exploit someone's got to break that and we will break that through. There is something which uh, I'll invite uh, David to speak about a little bit more about love, for instance, that thing that's not spoken about enough. 
uh, certainly not in academic spaces. It's a very odd thing to talk about. Mm. But thinking about love and connection and humanity. So as individuals, building this awareness that I cannot do this on my own. I need to have a conversation with the person. Because, for instance, for me, as a descendant of the colonized, I did, the word colonization or coloniality or anything to do with colonization does not exi- exist in any of the native languages that my people speak. We don't even know what this is. We didn't create it. So then to expect us to dismantle it, how would we know? We are not the architects of this colonial project. So the only thing we can do is go to the architects of the colonial project and get to a point where we agree that this doesn't work anymore. The premise was wrong. However this came to be, this is not good for any of us. So let's work together to find something better for all of us. Not something better for me so that I can revenge everything that you did. You know, that's not my job. (laughs) It's somebody else's job to do that. But for me, I just want us to get to a point where we can move together as human beings, a new new way of being, so to speak. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. we have um, we have another question here in the in the chat. Uh, what do you see as the main barrier to measuring inclusion when fostering inclusive environment? Uh, David, would you like to start with that one, and then Candy can continue. You know, I'm I'm the worst person to ask a measuring question to. Right? Okay. <laughs> you uh, can you can you can start with it, Candy, if you prepare. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's one of those things, you you do not need to datafy injustice, right? We know it exists. Um, now, the way systems work, yes, what you measure, what you focus on expands, yes. Um, but this notion of measuring, right, again, moves us in deeper into the colonial project, right, where everything has to be quantified and qualified and verified. Right. Um, so I don't care about your measurements. Right. <laughs> what I care is that the human beings that you are encountering within the systems that you inhabit feel like they belong, feel like they are seen, feel like they are welcomed and respected. Right. Rather than than doing this quantification. Game. It it has not worked for us. Right. And it doesn't work. Mm. Candy, do you agree with that? I, I, I love this idea of, uh, you know, uh, at least being critical about the numberification, numberification of, of social realities. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. The 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 the, 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 the datafication as well. All yeah? right. So yeah. Data, whatever it is, and and absolutely. I mean, because in in the West, we always, or in the geopolitical North, we believe that that which doesn't get measured doesn't get done. And the the reality is that there is something called human experience, and it's very easy to see through outcomes um, and changing outcomes of people, whether they feel included or not, whether they have a sense of belonging or not. Because if I am having to come into a place of work um, and having to code switch to a degree that I leave most of my authentic self out of the space in order to just survive and thrive, you're getting 60, 50, 40% of me. What will be the outcome? But if then I don't have to code switch to such a degree and now you're getting 80% of me, you will know. Mm-hmm. You will know it's obvious and you don't have to measure it in actual numbers. So yes, I understand the, the point of this question by Virginia because it's difficult to measure. I mean, there is a barrier to measuring it if you take inclusion out of the context and say this thing called inclusion let me now measure this one thing it's impossible to do as i think because it's something that is inherent in us something we feel something that you can see through observing us and you can ask questions obviously you can do longitudinal studies where are people now we make that you know there are certain interventions where are they you know a few months down the line a few years down the line those studies are there but then you have got to consider what other factors are in that context as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to exclude, to extricate just this one thing and say this is the only thing that we can see has improved and therefore what? 
you see. So that's how I would look at it. Yeah, thank you. There, there is a, a, an interesting discussion in the chat going on about about the importance of uh, measuring. Uh, somebody says, well, if we can't measure it, we can't call it out. And somebody else replies, but perhaps, perhaps what we need to do is to change or expand the metrics. I, I wonder if it's worth considering that, you know, there will be people who will produce metrics and that's fine. Uh, but metrics on their own will never tell the story and there are other ways of assessing the reality, understanding the reality uh, that do not necessarily um, require numerical or data measurement. You know, uh, what, what what do you think? I mean, is, is my answer perhaps something that you agree with? Or? Um, I would say, you know, like for instance, at the University of Leeds, we have KPI, okay? And EDI, we have put KPI on EDI. Some people go, that's not a good thing to do. But again, we understand we work in a certain context and those metrics are important for certain people. But when we look at a KPI where we say we want to increase, for instance, the number of uh, people from uh, Black and Asian and minoritized ethnic background, um, the question is, how are we increasing those numbers? Is it just going out and hiring more people and displacing them strategically and meeting some quota or whatever it is? Or is it creating an environment where people want to come? And if you're saying people want to come and work here, why do they want to come and work here? It is because those who look like me who work here tell a story um, or give an example of someone who those who are looking at me from outside want to be. They look at me and say, I want to be like that. And if you can be that, if he can be that, if they can be that, then I want to be part of that. So there's that attraction piece. So there's a qualitative element that is also important. And also we start to think about attrition. How many people are leaving, you know, that leaky pipeline because they're not happy. People are staying and staying longer and progressing and, and, and creating and, and contributing to the growth and development of this community. Then definitely you can see through those metrics um, that um, that obviously you know inclusion has to be one of those things that's happening or occurring there. So you have the quantitative piece and the qualitative piece because if you're just getting more people into this space through clever advertising, that to me doesn't work. That's been counted. But if people are feeling attracted and wanting to come here, then that's what we want. Now we know inclusion equity is working in the space, the structural piece is working, right? The cultural piece is working. Well, I, would, I would add to that, Kindi, that you're very right. So very practically, yes, it is a qualitative and a quantitative assessment. Both are, both can be, uh, both should be done, right? And we have these things called climate surveys, which measure that exactly, they measure levels of inclusion within systems within organizations right do your employees feel welcome right that that could be a likert scale right and that could be um <laughs> for an answer right if not why right or if so why so there are ways of measuring those things and if we go back to the definition that we raised at the beginning right do i feel welcome do i feel respected do i feel like i'm valued here do i feel like my culture is appreciated Right in these spaces, those are measures of inclusion. In addition to, am I retaining my employees? Right? Um, am I? Um, um, are are folks happy here? Are they satisfied here in this space? Right? Um, but you you got my first answer because so often we move to the solution, right? Without understanding the issue and data helps us to move very quickly to, let me pinpoint these three things and let's figure out how to fix these three pain points. When equity, inclusion, um, diversity, justice are all intertwined, right? And I can feel like I matter in a space, but also not have, uh, not be taken seriously when I'm at the table, right? So I can feel like the culture says it values me as a person. It values my being in this space. Um, but I can sit at that same table and be ignored, right? Um, and so there, there are ways that we have to look at the total environment, 
right? Again, respect, welcome, uh, cultural appreciation, all of those things, things are key uh, in, in measuring what we call inclusion. Wonderful, wonderful. We have more questions in different ways. Um, before before that, I have a, you know, I have a question about um, uh, different spaces, different places in the world, where the uh, the ideas of equity, diversity, and inclusion are not that present in debates, or places that are socially different in in some respects uh, because they have a different history of in the ethnic diversity or whether that history of ethnic diversity is not really uh, developed is not present how can we how can we think about equity diversity and inclusion um globally you know what would you advise uh, to people who don't live in the United States, like you, David, or uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, like like you, Candy, or, or myself? Um, that's a good question. The first thing I would say is that equity, diversity, and inclusion is not just about race. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like David talked, said earlier about diversity, we have a whole raft of characteristics and intersection now into inter intersectionalizing of all of those characteristics. So I would say all human beings are a complex intersectional beings. So there isn't anyone who is any one thing. And if you have a complex intersectional beings sharing a space, there will always be some kind of tension. And especially where there is a perception, the resources are not enough and who gets what and all of that. So I would say EDI is present in every community on earth. They may not use the words equity, diversity, and inclusion because some of them don't need to. And others use different language and other ways of talking about the same things. But because capitalism is so prevalent, and you know, the because with the colonial project also comes capitalism. And what we see is, is a huge difference between the have and the have not. And it has. It is also in knowledge equity. There are people who have access to all the knowledge, or most of the knowledge that is being produced by, especially HEIs, and there are people who simply don't or struggle to get um, to get that. So what I would say is that I would be very um, careful not to do this work in a neo-colonial way to assume where the, the, the geopolitical north comes and says. This is what decolonizing looks like, and y'all are doing it wrong unless you do it this way. Or this is what EDI, equity, justice, whatever, mm. this is what it looks like. And unless you use these particular terms, then you're not doing mm. it. Unless you can, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So I think I would say that people are dealing with different challenges. I say from a personal perspective, I did not know I was black until I came here. Now, that was not a thing I struggled with where I grew up. It was completely irrelevant to me to think of myself as black. I come to England, yeah, I had to face my black self and try and figure out what that meant, right? Mm. Now, that does not mean that people in Kenya don't have iniquity and other issues of inequality that they do, they do, right? So I, I would be very careful not to assume that what we have here as an experience is what everybody else needs to have in order for them to qualify to have the conversation with us. Oh. We are all human beings try, striving for the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful, David, wonderful. I agree totally with everything that you said. It resonates very much with, with what I feel and defend. Uh, David, would you like to uh, add something to Kendi's uh, answer? I, I'll simply add what, what Kendi is, uh, very simply in the language that we use, what Kindi is talking about is the practice of cultural humility, right? Of, of understanding that you don't understand everything about everything or everyone. Um, and that you enter into different cultural context mm -hmm. with a posture of learning, uh, with a posture of openness to understand the issues that those particular cultures face. Mm -hmm. um, that, may not look like the issues that you face on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. But deep down, um, 
the issues are the same. And the, the issue for me, the sort of baseline issue are systems, um, understandings, uh, situations that prevent humanity from living out its fullness. Uh -huh. right? That's what we're dealing with here at, at the very baseline of everything, right? We are meant to live whole, full human lives, right? Yeah. Um, and what we deal with, especially with the, with the, with the colonial project with capitalism, where we have a scarcity mentality, which really doesn't exist, um, right? In truth, resources are, are plentiful, um, right? We are dealing with a limiting, a cutting off of the fullness of humanity at the, at the root of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to enter these situations with a posture of learning, with mm -hmm. a posture of understanding as we begin with our community agreement, right? Understanding. The Buddhists say is love by another name. Right? Mm -hmm. Kindi earlier mentioned love. Um, and love is not sentimentality or mush. Right? Love is respect. Love is recognition. Love is awareness. Love is discipline. Um, love is seeing the other in the fullness of who they are. Right? Yeah. Um, and so I could go on all day about love, but I'll, I'll stop there. Culture it's food, okay. Food. Yeah. So do you think do you think therefore that uh, perhaps you know I'm a, I'm a fan of critical pedagogy perhaps uh, we should invite everybody uh, in this event and everybody who will watch us later to actually think uh, and reflect uh, about their own societies their own spaces and be um, analyzing critically the inequities and the structures that uh, contribute to those inequities and you know um, perpetuate those inequities, which, you know, in every space, in every country may look relatively different, despite the fact that they have a, a common thread. Should we invite that reflection? I would say yes, because, um, you see, it's, the colonial project is like a two-edged sword, right? So there is a side that um, comes from the side of empire. So where the designing of this colonial project started and the reasons why it was and the power and the, and the exploitation and all of that. On the other side of it is a colonize, yeah? So, and when you think about that, the danger of the colonial project and for it to be successful is that the colonized had to believe the story that the colonizer was telling them about themselves. So they had to forget who they were and become this other that had been presented to them. And so you find that a lot of people, a lot of us who come from the geopolitical South, our measure of success is how like the colonizer will look, we speak, we eat, we do, we live, we be, okay? Mm -hmm. So that is the danger here. And that is why when we talk about decolonizing and people say, oh, let's diversify the reading list and let's just look for people with an exotic sounding name, my having this skin does not mean that I think any different to that other person who lives here in England and has never left England. I could be exactly the same because I went to perhaps similar schools, I was given the same information, um, I was in the same conversations, and I was taught how to think, how to think, not even, I was taught how to think, the process of thinking, and then I was told what to think about. And someone even suggested what the outcome of my thought process should be. And if it, if through tests and exams and everything, everything that we do in education, and if it doesn't fit that predefined outcome, then I am a failure, I am less than, mm -hmm. up to and including my own sense of civilization. Mm -hmm. So it is really important that we start to think how we can start to achieve that epistemic freedom, how yes. we can start to go back to our imagination and reconnect with our rooting, with ourselves, with our ancestors. And I know sometimes when we speak like this, it becomes like, oh, this is mumbo jumbo in higher education. Oh. How can you talk about ancestral being and realms and things like that? But I know I am a product of something I did not just spontaneously combust. And the fact that I am here breathing, speaking, speaks of the survival of my people way before any European set foot on the continent of Africa. So really, 
we need to be able to go back to that, understand who we are, and then recreate for ourselves a future that we want to see for us and for future generations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, very clear. And um, we 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 have a brief question because we are now approaching the end of the event. It's three minutes left. I'd like to ask you if you could give us uh, like uh, one minute each um, example of um, a successful initiative in in the area of equity, diversity, and inclusion that can or decolonization, if you prefer, uh, that can inspire our audience. Mm. an activity, a project, an initiative that is bringing people together, that is generating debate, um, you know, that is um, achieving that type of uh, reflection that we need to, we need to foster in different communities, in different spaces. Sorry, Antonio, I got just before, as David is thinking about his one minute, I just have to read this that uh, Daniel has put in the chat. Oh, and... yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, if, says... if, if you prefer to answer that one, that's fine. And David can I answer my a, question. It's a statement. Um, and they say that I find that there are different approaches to representing African cultures. Non-African writers often take a historical approach and the stories are consistently tragic. African books I found were often fictional and represented all sorts of facets of life. So the fiction seems to give me a better idea of life in different African countries than the so-called factual historical books. That is very interesting. And if anyone has heard of Chimamanda yeah. Ngozi Adichie, yeah. uh, um, the danger of a single story and all the other wonderful things that she has said, she speaks exactly of that. Yeah. And she says how in her first novel she was accused of lacking African authenticity because her stories were not tragic enough, poor enough. And yeah. this, Danielle, is an amazing point. And I think there are African writers now to think of something that's really starting to change the world is through art, through music, African music. Now mm. you can actually listen to African music on BBC One. Woohoo, yes. Um, <laughs> music and and certainly literature yeah. and of course the mainstreaming of african languages yeah definitely literature yeah. literature is always political even if uh, the writer doesn't think that it's political and literature is a window to the well so yes absolutely uh david um anything to add in relation to a, a project that you that you think could inspire our audience you know i'm i'm it's not going to be very inspiring, but but what I'm going to say is that I don't I don't know I don't know of any project right that is super inspired because this is an ongoing initiative, right? Yeah. We are every day um, having to practice onto epistemological fugitivity, <clears throat> right? And every day there is a new attack um, against this move from the powers that be, and so this is an mm -hmm. ongoing struggle. Right, the, the thing that that Kendi mentioned, right about, um, she talked about the violence of education. So initiatives like this, right, where we're getting to raise, she didn't say this exactly about the violence of education, but what what I take in in her words and what I understand about education as we know it as as part of the decolonial project is that it is a form of violence, mm -hmm. right? It is a form of violence, and perhaps one of one of the most effective forms of violence. Um, to get us to unthink, right? To get us to unlearn our ways of being and knowing. Uh, and so what, what I'll say about this sort of inspiring thing is that conversations like this that raise the point of onto epistemological fugitivity um, or of what we call liberation, right? Freeing mm -hmm. the minds that the rest of you can follow um, is extremely important to raise the issue but we are so deeply inculcated in colonialism, in oppressive systems, that it is an ongoing 365 all day, every day project to move ourselves away from it. And I will add, I'll plug one thing in the final 10 seconds. Thank you so much for that, David. We've got a project that's coming up, an event actually called Africa Week. Uh, it's the first Africa Week in Leeds. And the theme is Open Africa, Open World. 
and this is 20th to 25th of May. And we will be discussing all of these issues. What is a new university? What does it exist for? Who does it exist to serve? And how do we be within university spaces, especially from a decolonial perspective and looking at African institutions of higher learning, as well as those from other parts of the geopolitical South and those in the geopolitical North. So that's Africa Week, 20th, 25th of May, Open Africa, Open World here at Leeds. And Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, David, and uh, thank you so much, Kendi, and thank you so much to our colleagues uh, in the Ken team who made these events possible. It's been very inspiring. Uh, we need to keep the conversations. We need to keep the reflection. Uh, we need to uh, keep interrogating society, structures, universities, and um, try to create a space where we feel uh, confident that our stories, our experiences, our our questions are heard and respected. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'm sure this will be very valuable for uh, people committed to our a mission in the Knowledge Equity Network. And uh, looking ahead, uh, we have an event on the 21st of February uh, that will focus on open education, and it will feature uh, Professor Chris Inerancy, uh, Professor of Creative and Open Education at the University of Leeds, uh, also Senior Lead for Ken, along with um, guest speaker and artist George S. Fugaras and Dr. Gabby Whitehouse. Uh, who is an specialist, an academic specialist in uh, mass displacement? Mass displacement, yeah. So we look forward to that uh, to that event um, on safe spaces. And uh, yes, thank you so much to everybody. See you in the network. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.